Could a Neanderthal civil war explain the sudden collapse of Neanderthals in Western Europe 42,000 years ago? This isn't wild speculation. This is forensic fact. If one wishes to understand how the last Neanderthals of Europe were destroyed, there is no better place to look than the narrow belt of land stretching from the Charente to the Vienne and down toward the northern Dordogne in southwest France. Here, within a relatively small geographic radius, lie several sites whose final layers all end in the same violent, chaotic, abruptly terminated archaeological horizon all around 42,000 years ago. In Spain, which was once thought to be a Neanderthal stronghold until 28,000 years ago, new dating has also shown that the last Neanderthals lived about 42,000 years ago. Similarly, in Belgium, new dating has placed the last Neanderthal layers around 42,000 years ago, where older dates had suggest they survived until 35,000 years ago. All genetic evidence indicates that the French Neanderthals belonged to the Western Neanderthal clade, but were a hybrid population based on more gracile skeletal morphology. Chattel Peronian was a hybrid tools kit, and the Neanderthals that made it were also hybrids. Some may have even had red or dark blonde hair and light colour eyes from MC1R variants known in other Western Neanderthals. The French sites, Saint-Césaire, Le Roi, Grotte du Rennes, La Quina, and other late Mousterian and Chattel Peronian shelters capture the last moments of Western Europe's Neanderthals with a clarity so sharp that it reads not like a gradual extinction, but like a compressed disaster. What happened here in this landscape of limestone outcrops and sheltered valleys was not a slow demographic decline. It was the sudden destruction of Neanderthals within a span so short, two centuries, that it likely occurred within the memory of living generations. Eastern Neanderthals, being more conservative and genetically pure, would have encountered these Western hybrid groups as they fled westward from Homo sapiens. Every site appears to be deliberately destroyed, and the women and young killed the final destruction after the Neanderthal men had been taken out during battle. They did not die without a fight. Something profound happened. The most chilling evidence lies not in the stone tools, but in the condition of the bones and the floors on which those bodies once fell. These sites show the unmistakable signature of trauma. Perimortem fractures, disturbed skeletons, missing skull vaults, separated jaws, scattered vertebrae, broken ornaments, overturned hearths, and pulverized cultural layers. It is a record of violence. And because these sites are so tightly clustered, only a day's walk apart, the same pattern unfolding across them within the same 200-year window cannot be explained by coincidence. It is the archaeological fingerprint of a population being overrun. The small rock shelter of Saint-Césaire is the center of this catastrophe. The young adult Neanderthal discovered there often simply called the Saint-Césaire Neanderthal, was once heralded as the proof that Neanderthals made chattel Peronian tools. But beneath the interpretations lay a darker truth, one that only became fully visible when modern stratigraphic analysis stripped away the Romanticism. The layer in which the skeleton was found is not intact. It is not a burial. It is not a neat occupation floor with stable hearths and orderly living debris. The sediment is churned, twisted, collapsed, and violently disturbed. The skeleton itself appears scattered across a displacement block, a jumble of bones caught in a layer that had been broken and reworked before the archaeologists ever touched it. Long before the soil entombed the remains, something had already broken the site. When the skull fragments were reconstructed, the picture became even more disturbing. One part of the cranial vault, when subjected to digital analysis, revealed a lesion whose morphology matches a blow inflicted with a sharp, blade-shaped weapon. The cut penetrated the bone deep enough to fracture the internal lamina. She may have survived initially, but it was the kind of injury sustained in interpersonal conflict, not in a fall, not in accident, not in the inert collapse of sediment. The blow came from an angle indicating intention. Whoever struck this Neanderthal did so deliberately. When the rest of the skeletal remains are considered, the missing vault pieces, the displaced mandible, the scattered ribs, the absence of anatomical articulation, the picture becomes one of a body that died not in peace but in chaos. 
This skull is almost certainly from a Neanderthal who died in the final clashes between hybrid and pure Neanderthal bands in western France. It's one of the most important pieces of evidence for violent displacement during the extinction window. The site around the body is equally unsettling. The Chattel Peronian tools found nearby are not whole. Many are broken, snapped at the midsection, fractured as though stepped on or smashed. Ornaments are truncated, pierced teeth broken at the apex, bone awls snapped or crushed. Hearths that should form clear thermal halos appear overturned, their stones dislodged, their surrounding sediments blended and compacted. Microstratigraphy reveals trampling and reworking. It is a scene that resembles not a domestic floor, but an interrupted one. Something happened here, something forceful enough to change the structure of the sediment, scatter tools, break ornaments, and leave a wounded Neanderthal to die in the rubble. The skull tells another haunting story. When a body decomposes in situ, the skull tends to collapse inward as the soft tissues rot, leaving certain predictable patterns. At Saint-Césaire, the skull does show signs of collapsing in place, but the sediment around it had already been disturbed before the skull decomposed. This means that the head did not lie in a prepared grave or even a stable living floor. She may have fallen, been dragged, or been thrown down during or after a violent encounter. The surrounding bones show no careful placement, no funerary treatment. The site is not a cemetery. It is the archaeological echo of a destabilizing event, meaning the head may have been cut off or separated from the body. Just a short distance to the south lies Les Rois, a site with a long history of Neanderthal occupation. Here, too, the final Mousterian layers are broken, disturbed, and abruptly terminated. The most damning discovery at Les Rois is the disarticulated jaw of a Neanderthal. The mandible was found separated from the skull, no clean burial, no anatomical connection, no gentle interment. Dr. Fernando Rodzi of Paris's Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique said the jawbone had been cut into to remove flesh, including the tongue. Crucially, the butchery was similar to that used to cut up reindeer mandibles. These Neanderthals met a violent, Rossi said. The idea has provoked considerable opposition from those who believe Neanderthals disappeared for reasons that did not involve violence. However, the evidence shows that these interactions were violent and terminal for the Neanderthals. The discovery at Les Rois provides compelling support for that argument. The jaw's edges show fractures consistent with perimortem breakage, meaning the bone was broken while still fresh. Whether this signifies accidental trauma, intentional violence, or post-mortem manipulation, the implications are dire. If the Neanderthal died in an attack, the bones could be remnants of a killing event. If the jaw was separated post-mortem, then it indicates deliberate handling of the body. Either scenario fits into the wider pattern of destruction in this region. At Les Rois, the tools in the final layers tell a similar story to those of Saint-Césaire. Broken, incomplete, scattered. Scrapers snapped in half, retouched pieces truncated, bone implements fractured at angles consistent with force, not taphonomic pressure. The living floor is inconsistent and chaotic, with fire features that appear overturned or reworked. There is no sign of orderly habitation. The layer reads like a space abandoned suddenly, before the occupants could clean up, bury their dead properly, or escape with their toolkit intact. Forensic analysts studying the spatial patterning note that the artifacts seem trampled or jumbled, as though multiple disruptive episodes occurred in rapid succession. Likewise, the Neanderthal of Lakina Rock Shelter, a woman of about twenty-five years, was found in its muddy bed at a depth of two and a half feet. But she was not surrounded by a grave, nor was there any appearance of having been intentionally inhumed. On the contrary, the situation and circumstances indicated that the woman had either fallen from the cliff and was carried by the current of the stream into the place where she was found, and became permanently entombed in the sedimentary debris of the river. Again, as at St. Césaire, we have a young Neanderthal woman, no attempt at burial, she was simply left for dead. This is not normal Neanderthal behaviour. But at Lakina, we have a classic Neanderthal camp, not a Chattel Peronian site, suggesting that the civil war was not one-sided. The sites of Lakina and Arsi Sokura reinforce this picture, though in different ways. 
Lacina, a site with a long Musterian sequence, ends abruptly. The final layers become more chaotic, with scattered bone and stone, and then disappear entirely. The occupation surface is not worn out by gradual long-term use. It simply stops. At Arcy sur cure the celebrated Grotte du Rennes contains Châtelperonian ornaments, many of which are broken. Pierced animal teeth show fractures at their suspension points. Ivory elements appear snapped. Bone awls are broken. Some researchers argue that these breakages are due to natural sediment pressure, but the distribution of fragments and the condition of the layers suggest a more complex history, one that again involves disturbance. The question becomes unavoidable. Who destroyed these Neanderthal camps? To answer that, one must summarize the synchrony of dates. At Les Cotes, sediment DNA shows that Neanderthals disappeared 42,000 years ago. At Saint-Césaire, the occupation layer is assigned to nearly the same interval. Les Rois also ends within this narrow band. Lacina's upper layers disappear around the same time. The Chateau Peronian of arcy sur cure disappears in the same region of the radiocarbon curve. This tight synchronicity is not scattered across millennia. It is compressed into a couple of centuries, at most 300 years. In archaeological time, that is not a slow disappearance. That is a coordinated destruction. In southwest France, the Neanderthals had been holding on to the last patches of habitable territory. The sudden appearance of Aurignacian tools and occupation layers immediately above the disrupted Neanderthal floors suggests not a long coexistence, but a rapid displacement. At Les Cotes, the sediment DNA shows Neanderthals one moment and then none. In the next level, Aurignacian. The turnover is immediate and total. In southeast France, the site of Grotte Mandrin also shows such disturbed layers with a single disarticulated Neanderthal jaw found outside of the cave. Returning to Saint-Césaire, the combination of trauma on the skull, the disturbed deposition, the broken tools, the smashed ornaments, and the chaotic sediments paints the clearest picture of violence. She died during a moment of turmoil. Whether in the heat of a raid or the aftermath of one, her body did not receive the care that Neanderthals often afforded their dead. The skull's collapse in situ suggests the head remained on the ground as the soft tissues decayed. The surrounding disturbance means the body may have been moved, trampled, or manipulated after or during death. The missing fragments of the cranial vault and the scattered ribs are consistent with a scene in which multiple bodies or multiple objects were moving across the ground at the time of deposition. This is not a burial. It is a warfare. Les Rois reinforces the same conclusion. The separated Neanderthal jaw of the Neanderthal was not the result of long-term sediment pressure. The breakage occurred at or near the time of death. The absence of a complete skeleton, the lack of burial context, and the disturbed layer all suggest that this young Neanderthal's death was part of a larger episode. The site looks like a camp that was disrupted and then abandoned. The truncated tools and broken hearths echo the same kind of sudden destruction observed at Saint-Césaire. What is notable about these two sites is how close they are to one another. The path between them can be walked in a single day. This means the same group of Neanderthals or affiliated groups within a small regional network could have inhabited both sites. If violence struck one, it would inevitably affect the others. The clustered nature of these late Neanderthal camps makes it unlikely that the destruction was random. It is far more likely that a single wave of events whether raids, territorial conflicts, or forced displacements swept through this region and shattered multiple communities in succession. The combined archaeological evidence, trauma on the Saint-Césaire skull, the disarticulated mandible at Les Rois, broken ornaments, smashed tools, overturned hearths, disturbed floors, and abrupt abandonment, points toward violent encounters. What form did this violence take? The evidence does not permit precise reconstruction, but the patterns align with small-scale raids or confrontations. Neanderthal communities were small, often at the scale of extended families, especially hybrid groups. Eastern Neanderthals moving into the region could easily overwhelm the smaller hybrid groups. Their expansion into the region during a period of ecological stress would have put direct pressure on Neanderthal territories, leading to a Neanderthal civil war. 
The archaeological record in southwest France captures the final outcome conflict. It shows the dissolution of Neanderthal social order, the destruction of their camps, the scattering of their dead, and the immediate arrival of another population in their place. A span of two centuries is all that separates the flourishing of Neanderthal groups in this region from their total disappearance. In human terms, that is not the slow extinction of a species. It is the violent end of a people, and the sights tell the story with forensic precision. The battered skull at Saint-Césaire, the broken jaw at Les Bois, the fractured ornaments at arcy sur cure the overturned hearths at Les Cotes, the missing vault fragments, the scattered vertebrae, the chaotic deposition, the absence of burials, the sudden silence in the sediment DNA, all aligned within the same tight range of radiocarbon dates, all clustered in the same geographic corridor, all marking the same extinction pulse. Southwest France was not simply the final home of Europe's Neanderthals. It was the ground on which their world was violently unmade. The archaeological record of southwest France 42,000 years ago shows a sudden violent destruction of Neanderthal society. This destruction is best explained by Neanderthal on Neanderthal conflict. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat between Neanderthals is the more parsimonious explanation for the trauma, site destruction, abandoned floors, and immediate cultural replacement seen across the charente dordogne corridor. At the centre of this picture stands Saint-Césaire, where the young adult Neanderthal died from a sharp force blow to the head. A weapon strike, not an accident. The remains lie in a disturbed, churned, broken layer filled with smashed Chateauperonian tools, truncated ornaments, overturned hearths, and displaced bones. This is not a careful burial or peaceful living floor. It is the aftermath of violence. The skull collapsed in place as it decomposed, yet the sediment around it was already disturbed, implying the body lay on a floor shattered before or during death, possibly dragged or manipulated. This context matches the signature of a raid or attack, not an internal quarrel. Just south of Saint-Césaire, the site of Les Jois preserves a young Neanderthal jaw broken and separated from the skull at or near the moment of death. The layer is disturbed, the hearths overturned and the artifact scattered, another camp abandoned in chaos. The same pattern occurs at Les Cotes, where Neanderthal DNA disappears abruptly around 42,000 years ago. At arcy sur and La Quina, the Châtelperonian ornament layers are smashed, truncated and disturbed. The trauma at Les Bois and Saint-Césaire fits Neanderthal hand-to-hand -hand violence, not Homo sapiens weaponry. Every site shows one final chaotic Neanderthal layer, broken, overturned and disturbed, followed by modern humans a few thousand years later. There is never a return of Neanderthals afterward. The timing is also decisive. The destruction horizon aligns perfectly with the arrival of modern humans in Europe. Modern humans arriving with larger populations, broader alliances and long-range projectile weapons held every strategic advantage. Neanderthals, fragmented into small isolated groups, could not withstand coordinated pressure, and this led to conflict between Neanderthal groups. The archaeological signatures, trauma on the Saint-Césaire skull, the Lakina Neanderthal woman left for dead, the disarticulated jaw at Les Rois, smashed ornaments, disrupted campsites, and abrupt abandonment are best explained by eastern Neanderthals violently displacing Châtelperonian Neanderthals during a scramble for territory. Taken together, the evidence forms a single coherent conclusion. The final destruction of Neanderthals in southwest France was not a slow extinction it was a civil war thanks for watching